Hello, all you lovely people. All the lovely people. Where do you all come from? Welcome to D&D Optimized, the show where each episode we take a deep dive into one or two specific character builds in Dungeons & Dragons 5e, and we do our best to crunch some numbers and uh, try and optimize them to make them as powerful as possible uh, for you in game. So if you, like me, enjoy thinking about new characters in Dungeons and & Dragons and theory crafting on what character you'd like to play next and how to make them really cool and really powerful and really fun, then welcome home. This show is for you. And uh, we are happy to have you, so thanks for being here. My name's Colby, and uh, I will be your host. So we are, um, we're 22 episodes in now, not counting the, the little shorts and sliding into my DM stuff that I've started recently. And in the 22 episodes that we have done, there is one class and one class only that I have not even taken a multi-class dip into. And you all know what it is. It's the Artificer. And I have a little problem with the Artificer. And it's, and it's purely personal and, and it's, just, it's, just, it's just me, right? The concept of it, I think, is really cool. I just sometimes have a hard time with mixing steampunk with my fantasy. And sometimes I, I like a little, just a little separation between the steampunk and the fantasy. And the Artificer kind of crosses over that border a little bit. And I think that's kind of the main reason why I've had a hard time putting together something for the Artificer. But I decided today to swallow my own personal bias and to jump in. And we were long overdue for a tank build, something other than sustained damage, right? And so I decided to take a look at how I could build the best tank possible using the Artificer class, because there are some fantastic options, as many of you know, especially if you are a fan of the Artificer. And so if you have been waiting patiently, thank you for your patience. And I'm excited to jump into the Armorer, episode 22, um, today. Now, before we get into the level-by-level -level build, um, there are some really great options for the Artificer if you want to be a tank. I mean, if you want to do damage and, and or support, there's great options too. Um, I feel like they really can shine as a tank build. And again, for those not familiar with that phrase when it comes to games and gaming in general, obviously when, we, when we're talking about a tank, we're talking about someone who is both A, hard to kill, and ideally B, who can do a good job of sort of protecting their teammates, right? And keeping their teammates safe and keeping their teammates from harm and ideally maybe even drawing the enemy fire somehow, right? Things like that. Um, there's really two subclasses, I think, to look at in order to fulfill the tank role um, if you're trying to become an artificer, if you want to be an artificer tank. I think there's the battlesmith and the armorer. The battlesmith is really cool. Um, you know, they get some additional spells uh, that other artificers don't get that are great for tanks. Um, they have the awesome sort of companion. They're sort of the ranger of the artificers. They get the steel defender, um, which does a little better damage than, than the other pet that you can get as an artificer, the hum homunculus, which we'll talk about later. Um, but more importantly, they can impose disadvantage on an enemy, the steel defender can, um, which is a great way to sort of protect your allies, right? By giving your enemies disadvantage if they were to attack those allies. Um, and that's fantastic. The problems, the weaknesses maybe with um, the, the battlesmith are that they don't innately get access to heavy armor, which is gonna impact your AC. You could get there with feats and things, but you know, that it's a stretch. Um, 
they don't get to add the additional infusions that the armorer gets, and we'll talk about infusions later. Um, and so when it comes to just pure survivability of the battlesmith, I think they're, they're just, they're, they're not quite as beefy. They're not quite as tanky in that regard as far as survivability. And in the other tank builds that I've done thus far, the two, I've only done two others, right? The Bear Totem Barbarian or Barbarian and the Paladin tank or the Tankadin, um, I'm, I'm looking and crunching the numbers to kind of look at survivability. Obviously, there are other factors to consider when we're considering what makes a good tank. Um, but I think for all of those reasons, I decided to go with the Armorer. Um, Battlesmith is definitely cool, and maybe we'll do a build on it in the future. And if not, you know, always, of course, take a look at it and see if it's something that seems really fun to play for you. But for today, we're going to focus on the Armorer. So let's jump into the build. So a little preview. I've got a couple of surprises baked in here. We're not going to go straight Artificer. We're going to we're going to do a couple of multi-class dips. Um, I don't know that either of them are necessary, but I like the benefits that they both give us. So we're going to dip a little bit into a cleric and we're going to dip a little bit into even a war mage, which I know will please some of you because I've had a lot of requests for a war mage build. Um, but the most surprising thing of all at level one for your race, I'm going to recommend a mountain dwarf. <laughs> I know, it's not a variant human or uh, or a uh, custom lineage. Believe me, I'm just as shocked as you are. I think, I think a variant human or, or custom lineage actually would both be a, a decent pick here. And there are definitely some good feats that we could benefit from um, with this build. But I think that they're maybe not quite as important as your just raw ability scores. And the Mountain Dwarf, while giving you the added bonus of being a dwarf, and who doesn't want to be a dwarf because they're cool, especially like an engineer type dwarf, that just feels right, doesn't it? Maybe gnomes too, but anyway. But Mountain Dwarfs, as many of you know, I'm sure, have the unique um, ability to start with a plus two to two ability scores. I think they're the only race that gets that. Um, and I love numbers. So we're getting the plus two and the plus two. Now, of course, pre-Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, that was a plus two to Constitution and a plus two to Strength. Now, um, as long as your DM allows you to use Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, right, um, you can have that plus two and plus two in whatever you want. Um, and so we are going to, uh, you know, getting into ability scores here. I always assume, of course, that we're rolling for our ability scores, or sorry, <laughs> not rolling, uh, taking the point by, right? And so you're gonna buy a 15 constitution and take your plus two there for 17. You're gonna buy a 15 intelligence and take your plus two there. Um, so you are a very intelligent and not necessarily strong dwarf, making you different than many of your kin. Um, so dwarves get, you know, mountain dwarves are, are cool, and I love starting with those two uh, 17 stats. You're also going to want to take a 14 in wisdom, um, primarily because uh, we're going to multi-class into cleric, as I mentioned, and you need to have at least a 13. Some of you may be asking, why not take at least some strength so you can get heavy armor, but hmm, we'll get into that in a second. So the rest... Put, put the stats where you want. You're not going to have much left to play with. But anyway, as far as equipment goes, I would make sure to do the gold buy option um, because the starting equipment for the Artificer doesn't really give us a lot of what we want or need. Um, so I would go gold buy and try and pick up some chainmail armor, which is tough because you are not proficient in heavy armor yet. Um, so you can't use it. You're just lugging it around. It was it was a gift given to you by your um, by your artificer master, and you're working on it, but you haven't yet completed the project, right? I don't know. Um, so get yourself some chain mail. Get yourself a shield, and that that's those are the primary concerns, uh, really. Um, as far as you know, what damage we're doing, we're not probably going to be doing weapon damage because we're not going to have a high dex or a high strength. Um, so 
we'll get into spells in a second, but your your damage in the first couple of levels are going to come from like a, an easy cantrip, right? Um, let's see. I, so, okay, so fine. Speaking of spells, you get a couple of cantrips. One, like I said, pick up something like a firebolt um, that can let you do damage for, from range. You're super squishy right now. You have no armor. Um, you have a shield, but low deck, so just stay alive. Um, and I would get Thorn Whip. Thorn Whip is a fantastic spell. We haven't talked about it a lot, though. I, it comes up a lot in the comments. Um, you know, it lets you make a spell attack, um, and it's a 30-foot range, which is pretty nice, and then you do 1d6 of damage if you hit, and you get to pull the target 10 feet closer to you. You don't necessarily want to be doing that a lot right now, but you definitely will later. Um, so <clears throat> it, it will be, once you are tanky, it, it'll be a nice little form of control that you can use as an action if you really need to kind of grab somebody and pull them towards you, either because they're out of range and you can't hit them yet, or they're starting to get to your back line, your support characters, your ranged characters back there, and you're trying to sort of protect them, defend them, uh, so pulling them towards you is great. Um, you also want, you also get a couple of first level spells here. Um, I would just say, uh, make sure that, um, you get absorb elements. That's a great spell for, for tankiness. Um, when you get hit by a fire or cold or acid or poison or lightning damage spell, I believe, um, then that gives you as a reaction, you get resistance, right? to that damage, which is great. It'll cut it in half, and then on your next turn when you make an attack, you get to add a, a d6 of, of damage of that type to your attack, which is great. Um, and I'd probably pick up Cure Wounds as well as a first level spell, which is available to Artificers, and it'll just be nice to have a nice heal spell in a pinch. Again, you are not gonna be super focused on damage. You're gonna be primarily a tank, and secondarily, I think, support, and tertiarily. Hmm. Uh, damage dealer. So, anyway, that is our level one. At level two, at level two, artificers get something called infusions. And infusions are, they're similar to um, warlock um, invocations. So, basically, it, this is what it says in the, in the, uh, in the book. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can touch a non-magical object and imbue it with one of your artificer infusions, turning it into a magic item. You can infuse more than one non-magical object at the end of a long rest. The maximum number of objects appears in the infused items column of the artificer table. For a while, it's gonna be two, then three, then four. Um, but you must touch each of the objects and each of your infusions can only affect one object at a time. So you can't, you can't put like the same infusion into something to get multiple bonuses from it, right? No object can bear more than one of your infusions at a time. So, so for our infusions, we get two, and we're gonna take enhanced defense and put it on our armor. So that will give our armor a plus one to AC, armor class, very nice. And then enhanced weapon, which will uh, we actually won't use yet, um, but next level we will, and that will make your weapon a plus one to hit and plus one to attack magical weapon, right? A plus one weapon. So that is fantastic and is going to give us some nice bonuses. So let's get into the next level. At level three, um, you get a an artificer specialization. You're a specialist, and the specialist that you're going to be is an armorer, as we've discussed. Um, there's a lot of great things about the armor. First of all, basically you, you get to have this armor that you have crafted, right? You can take the, the, the armor that you have and essentially enhance it. I like to think of it as kind of a steampunky mech suit. You may think of it differently and, and in game it may look and feel different than that. But anyway, regardless, you're essentially modifying and bolstering your armor. Um, you can switch out what that armor is if you get some better armor down the line. And by the way, now that we're proficient in heavy armor, because we are, um, you are going to want to pick up the, the best heavy armor that you can and make that your special armor, right? Um, so, you know, when you can get splint mail, pick that up. It's only a couple hundred gold. 
Obviously, when you can get plate mail, grab that. It's expensive. It's 1,500 gold, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to get it, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, the nice thing here is that when you are using this specialized modified armor, you get to ignore any strength requirements for that armor. So you could theoretically wear even heavy, uh, sorry, plate mail that's normally a 15 strength requirement without that requirement. So that's fantastic. Now, one cool thing about the armorer is that when you have this special armor, um, you get to choose the model that your armor uh, takes on. You get a couple of options, either the Guardian model or the Infiltrator model. The Infiltrator is cool. It's kind of designed more for stealthiness and ranged attacking. Um, we obviously are going to go with the Guardian being the tank that we are. Um, and the Guardian model gives you some cool features. Um, first of all, it gives you thunder gauntlets, it's called. And so each of your gauntlets is considered a, uh, a simple weapon. It's a D8 to hit. And when you make an attack with it, you get to use your intelligence modifier to hit and to damage. So that's why we didn't need dex or strength, right? Um, now we can just really focus on those two main stats for ourselves, constitution and intelligence. And the greatest thing about this is that when an enemy is hit by one of your gauntlet attacks, until the beginning of your next turn, I believe, let me double check that, um, yes, until the beginning of your next turn, uh, they, the enemy that you hit, have disadvantage when they attack anyone other than you. Um, the, 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 the power of that cannot be overstated, I feel like. When, when most, most of the time when people think of a tank in a role-playing game, especially if we're thinking about online role-playing games like your World of Warcraft, and I've talked about this before, I know, bear with me. Um, you know, we, we, we think about a tank who stands there and taunts the enemy so that the enemy is sort of compelled via game mechanics to attack them and no one else. That does not exist in Dungeons and & Dragons. And so your job as a tank is to find ways to make you the most compelling target to attack. You can't force them to. You cannot force your dungeon master to attack you. <laughs> You cannot force the monsters that your dungeon master is controlling to attack you. Um, but you can make it much more appealing for them to attack you and for it to make much more sense for them to attack you. So if you are giving disadvantage for them to attack anyone but you, the likelihood that you're going to get attacked goes way up, right? Um, and so that is really, really powerful, obviously. Um, the other nice thing that you get here is defensive field. So defensive field as a bonus action, you gain temporary hit points equal to your level in Artificer, um, replacing any temporary hit points that you already have. And um, you can do that in equal to a number of times per day equal to your proficiency level. So whatever your proficiency is, you can do it that many times per day. So it's a nice little self heal in a pinch or a little shield for yourself, I guess, in a pinch. Um, one thing that I'll mention about the Thunder Gauntlets, <clears throat> it's, it's possible, depending on, on, on your Dungeon Master, right, that you might get some pretty good damage out of these if you attack with both of them and discard your shield, right? Now, obviously, you're gonna lose AC, making you less tanky, but having additional attacks and thereby you know, imposing disadvantage on your enemies if they attack anyone other than you on multiple enemies, right? On two enemies potentially in a, in a round could be really great and could give you some extra damage too, especially if your DM lets you add your intelligence modifier to the damage of your bonus action, two weapon fighting action attack. Now, I know. 
you didn't take the two-weapon fighting style, and so normally you should not be able to add any sort of ability modifier to the damage of your bonus action, offhand, whatever you want to call it, attack. I think there's an argument to be made here that you should be allowed to. It says in the description, right? Each fist counts as a simple melee weapon. Now, it also then says, um, when you attack with the model's weapon, you can add your intelligence modifier to attack and damage rolls. So you could make the argument that, you know, these each get the intelligence modifier. Now, it also says each of the, each of the gauntlets, okay, it says, um, you can add your intelligence modifier instead of strength or dexterity. Now, if your strength or dexterity is a plus zero on that offhand attack, then you probably don't get to add your intelligence modifier to the offhand attack, right? But the argument could be made, so consider that, talk it over with your dungeon master. Regardless, um, the damage can be really good, um, and uh, more importantly, imposing disadvantage on more targets in a, in a round might be worth discarding that shield. And there's other reasons why you might want to think about discarding your shield later. We'll get into them in a minute. Um, okay, level four. You get an ability score increase or feat. I'm going to recommend that you take the ability score increase, and since your intelligence is at a 17 and your constitution is, a, is at a 17, you do a plus one in each. So now you're an 18 constitution and an 18 intelligence, and that's great. And, and having a high intelligence is really important for us um, because landing those hits, more than anything, landing those hits is what makes this class so great. And I would say, you know, doing whatever you can to increase your likelihood of getting a hit is uh, paramount. And of course, you know, we get lots of other benefits from a high intelligence for any other spells that we cast, etc. So um, that's the recommendation there. Now we're at an 18 con and an 18 int. Moving on to level five. All right, we're gonna take a one level dip here into Cleric. Um, for two reasons. I, at, at level one as a cleric, you get to choose your um, your domain, right? And I love the peace domain that's new to Tasha's um, Cauldron of Everything. Um, as a peace cleric, you get this amazing feature. It's called Emboldening Bond. And Emboldening Bond is like, it's a, it's a poor man's um, bless spell. In fact, in some ways it's better than the bless spell. It doesn't require concentration, um, and you can, as an action, all you and all of your companions, as long as you're within 30 feet of each other, um, create you, you create a bond between all of you, and then for the next 10 minutes, anytime any of you make an attack, or a saving throw, or an ability check, you get to add a d4, and that's that's what Bless does. It lets you add that d4 to those things, right? Now, it's not every attack or every saving throw. It's once per turn, but still, that's really powerful. It's a really, really strong support uh, feature that all of your companions will love, and you can use it constantly. You get to do that, again, number of times equal to your proficiency bonus per day. So obviously, at first, you might not be able to use it you might not be able to use it for every encounter, um, but most. And before long, you'll probably be able to use it for every encounter. And an extra D4 once per turn on all of those things is just, it's really powerful, including for yourself, right? So you're gonna be landing those attacks a lot more frequently. The other great thing about uh, a one level cleric dip is um, that we get access to some important spells, um, namely, Shield of Faith. We, we don't have a great use for our concentration early on, in my opinion, from a tank perspective. So I want to take Shield of Faith because it's a concentration spell that clerics get and others, but that clerics get that lets you um, bump your armor class by two. 
as long as you maintain concentration. And since we're going for survivability and tankiness, that's a fantastic feature. So always having a sort of a permanent plus two to your armor class now is great. And um, I love getting Healing Word here, which Artificers do not have. And Healing Word, of course, is a heal that you can use from range as a bonus action. Uh, it doesn't heal for a ton. It's like a D4 plus your Wisdom modifier, I guess it'll be here. Um, but really, it's a great in a pinch when somebody goes unconscious and you can pop them up as a bonus action and still um, make an attack with your action and things. So um, healing words are great to have here for us. At level six, we're going back to Artificer for a minute. Um, and so we are Artificer five. We get to pick up extra attack thanks to our uh, armor specialty. Um, and that's fantastic. Again, I would use your attack. If, if you are within range of two targets, I would use one on each of them, assuming that the first one lands, right? Um, because again, you're more concerned about imposing disadvantage on them than you are necessarily about trying to kill them, right? You're not doing a ton of damage. You're doing okay damage. It's not great. Um, but most importantly, you're imposing disadvantage on them if they attack anyone but you. And you want them to attack you and not your friends. So try to try to hit two targets if, if they are in range. Um, you also get second level artificer spells here. Um, as an armorer, you innately get mirror image, which is fantastic if you're trying not to get hit. It takes an action to cast just as a refresher and it creates three duplicates of yourself that potentially when an enemy tries to hit you, um, they will hit one of your or try to hit one of your mirror images instead. If they hit it, it will disappear, and then you'll have two left, and then one left. So it'll be a nice way for you to uh, avoid taking damage. And and again, you know, hopefully, even if you have mirror image up, if the guy that you're fighting against has disadvantage against an enemy, and mirror images against you, I don't know. They they, you might want to be careful about using that, depending on your dungeon master. Um, they might decide that the monster says, eh, these mirror images, I don't want to attack this guy, he's too hard to hit. Uh, even though I have disadvantage, I'm going for his friend. So, consider it um, can be good to use, in, uh, depending on the situation. Um, but then you also, I would pick up, make sure you pick up Lesser Restoration. Um, that's just a great spell that any, any good support character should have access to. It cures blindness, deafness, uh, paralyzation, and poison. So... That's a, that's a good one to, to take up. Level six, damage report. Okay, for those who have not yet seen one of my tank builds, we, we do damage reports a little bit differently when we're looking at tanks. So, so we, we are interested not necessarily in how much damage they do, but in how much damage they take and how long they can survive, right? So we've got two statistics. Damage taken uh, per round. Instead of DPR, it's DTPR. And then rounds to die, which is really what we're primarily interested in, right? If you were to take that much damage every single round, how long would it take you to die? We've come up with some controls, some control monsters, some control encounters. They're, they're medium difficulty encounters as per the uh, encounter builder. And um, I kind of have like a boss fight and then just sort of an average non-boss regular encounter fight with a few enemies. And we've kind of used those for the controls throughout uh, in the other builds and we'll continue to do so here so that we can actually compare them to one another and see how they match up. So, um, at level six, assuming you've managed, I'm assuming you've managed to pick up plate mail by now. I realize that might not necessarily be the case. Um, you should at least have splint mail, but Hopefully you've got plate mail by now, um, you've got your shield, you've got your infusion on your armor, um, and you've got uh, shield of faith from your cleric. Your armor class with all of those would be a 23, and you would have 57 hit points. Um, you might not, as we've discussed, you might not want to use a shield all of the time. Um, you might just, it might be better for you to use a second attack, right, one with each hand. Um, figure that out, play it by ear, uh, and see how difficult it is for the enemies to hit you. And if they're not even coming close, then stow your shield and start swinging. Um, boss fight. Uh, at this level, the boss was a young white dragon. 
and it was going to do, it, it would be doing 12 damage per round to you, so you're, you've got a 12 DTPR, um, and it would take you five rounds to die at that level. Um, the average regular encounter was uh, against four Berserkers, and your DTPR is seven, seven damage per round you'd be taking, and you would survive at that rate for nine rounds. And then just for fun, we like to throw in 10 kobolds. And against 10 kobolds, you would have a DTPR of 6, and your rounds to die would be 10. All right. At level 7, you are Artificer 6. Um, you get, at Artificer 6, you get, an, you get to infuse another item. So um, you, you get a third infusion, essentially. And... Um, I'm going to recommend taking Repulsion Shield, which you couldn't have gotten yet until you were level 6 anyway. Um, Repulsion Shield is awesome. It basically gives a plus 1 to your shield's armor class. Cool beans. And then um, you get to uh, 1d4 times per day. When you get hit, as a reaction you can push the attacker 15 feet away from you, which can be cool to either just protect, you know, your friends and or push them off a cliff and or push them over to your raging barbarian or push them into, you know, your wizard's web spell or something like that, right? Lots of cool uses um, for that. Um, you also get access to a different infusion here called Enhanced Weapon, or sorry, Radiant Weapon. I would replace Enhanced Weapon with Radiant Weapon. Um, it's kind of the same thing. You get a plus one uh, to your weapon, but then you also, 1d4 charges per day, um, reaction after being hit again, you can cause the attacker to make a constitution save or be blinded. And again, for those who don't know, when the enemy is blinded, they have disadvantages on their attack. They have disadvantage on their attacks, and you have advantage on attacks against them. Um, and that lasts until the end of their next turn. So that's potentially really strong and a great kind of support feature, right? To suddenly this guy has disadvantage against everybody. Everybody has advantage against them. And uh, yeah, that's that's a very powerful little uh, little tool that you've got at your disposal now. At level 8, we're going to press the pause button on the Artificer and we're going to take a couple of wizard dips. Um, it, it's it's great to multi-class wizard here because it's the, it's the only other intelligence focused um, class, right? And so you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, multiple ability score dependency um, you just you're you're already you already qualify, and they get some great benefits that I think are are worth taking a couple of levels for. First of all, arcane recovery that wizards get at this level, level one, is really nice. Um, basically, it's going to give you an extra spell slot per day, first level spell slot per day. But shield spell is one of your most important spells, so having one more casting of that or another first level spell, you know, a holy word or something, uh, or healing word, sorry would be really nice. Um, so when it comes to spells, the spells that you want to take as a first level wizard, you just get first level spells obviously, um, you want to take the shield spell, as I mentioned. And well, let's get into that. So again, shield, the way it works is if you get hit by an, by an attack, um, you can, as a reaction, throw up a shield, a magical shield, that will bump your armor class by five, and that lasts until the beginning of your turn. So that will last for the rest of this turn, essentially. Any other enemies that are attacking you, your armor class is five higher. That's so good. When your armor class is as high as it is already, especially, you're going to be next to impossible to hit when you use this. Um, so that that is worth the price of admission. Um, and find familiar is the other one I would take. It's, it's, it's just such a generic, well-rounded, awesome for everything spell, right? You get to summon your familiar, and then not only can it take the help action on its turn, potentially giving you or one of your allies advantage on on an attack, um, but you can uh, you can see through your familiar's eyes 
and you know explore a dungeon and things I mean you could be attacked and killed <clears throat> but assuming that you stay safe you could scout ahead explore deliver something can not really deliver a message because you can't speak but at least see what's going on I mean that's just there's so many great uses for the find familiar that it's hard for me not to take it when it's available um, at level 9 you are a wizard too and you get an arcane tradition and we are going to take war magic um, again I've had a lot of people ask me to do a war mage I haven't done a full war mage build I may one day but at the very least we're gonna take a dip here war magic is great and at level 2 right when you get it you get a couple of nice features first of all you get tactical wit which lets you add your intelligence bonus to your initiative rolls fantastic it's always great to go earlier in the turn especially as a tank so you can get in position and start you know uh, imposing disadvantage on your enemies and things and then you get this really cool ability the main reason why we're here um, arcane deflection arcane deflection lets you um, it's similar to the shield spell that we just talked about when you get hit you can as a reaction add two to your armor class potentially making that attack miss or if you fail a saving throw as a reaction you can add four to your saving throw potentially allowing you to succeed at that save and that is so awesome and there are no limits to the number of times you can use that and it's so great it's such a great tanky feature for you to stay alive keep yourself from getting controlled and charmed and feared and paralyzed and stunned and and all of these things it's just gonna it's gonna make you a much better and stronger tank to stay in the fight um, keep in mind unlike the shield spell that doesn't last that that bump to your armor class or to your saving throw doesn't last until the beginning of your next turn it's just for that single attack or single spell but still um, really nice to have it takes up your reaction so you could only use it once right per round but still um, super strong so level 9 damage report um, so we are we're gonna assume from here on out that you are getting a plus 5 to your armor class from the shield spell I know you're not gonna have infinity uh, spell slots to use that and for that matter you may have accidentally used your reaction on something else and now you can't cast the shield spell right I get it um, that said you're gonna be so hard to hit anyway that I don't feel too bad about assuming that you will have shield available to you sort of whenever you need it especially with arcane recovery and you get an extra spell slot um, you're just you're gonna be able to use shield a lot and keep in mind you can use a higher level spell slot to cast shield you don't get any additional benefit from it but if you're all out of first level spell slots you could use a second level spell slot if you want it um, it's just a bummer to burn a second level spell slot, but sometimes it might be worth it, right? Um, you also now have an additional plus one to your armor class from uh, the Radiant Shield Infusion. So your armor class right now is a 29 um, for the purposes of our number crunching. And you have 82 hit points. So the boss fight here is a young blue dragon, and your DTPR is a 4. Four damage per round is all you'll be taking from that young blue dragon and and again I didn't mention this but for these boss fights we are not we're not doing breath weapons we're not doing layer actions we're not doing legendary actions you know this is I mean this is simply a control to kind of say hey if this monster were just kind of pounding on you with their multi attack every turn what kind of damage would you take um, I realized that it wouldn't go down this way in game necessarily, but again, it's it's simply a control for the purposes of comparing these builds to one another. So, um, four damage per round, and your rounds to die is twenty one. Keep something in mind here: this young blue dragon has a plus nine to hit with a with an armor class of twenty nine. Assuming you have access to your shield spells, it will only hit you if it crits. So, you know, if you've got the spell slots, um, you're going to be very, very hard to hit here. And you might want to consider, um, again, stowing that shield and pounding on it with both of your fists um, to try and make sure that it, 
it uh, has disadvantage when it attacks somebody other than you. Um, for your average um, encounter at this level, we went with four hobgoblin captains, and the DTPR there would be six, and your rounds to die is 14. And against 10 kobolds, they're doing four damage per round, and it would take them 21 rounds to kill you. Okay. Hmm. The sun is setting, and it's making me all glowy. <laughs> Level 10, um, Flash of Genius is an artificer uh, ability that all artificers get. Little feature which is cool, it's a nice support feature. Basically when uh, an ally that you can see within 30 feet of you um, fails a save or makes an ability check, you can, as a reaction, add your intelligence modifier. You, you, you're noticing a theme here, there's a lot of uses for our reaction, right? Um, that can be a little tricky and deciding if only we had multiple per round, but we don't. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's nice, a great support feature, a way to help your ally out, especially if they fail a big save that's gonna really hurt them. Um, it'd be nice to be able to hopefully help them potentially uh, make that save, and again, you can use that a number of times per day equivalent to your intelligence modifier. At level 11, you're an Artificer 8, and you get, finally, another ability score increase or feat. And I'm going to recommend um, taking uh, just constitution, maxing your constitution at 20. There are some other great feats that, that are worth considering. We'll talk about them later. Um, but I just think for purposes of hit points, which you don't have a ton of, you, you know, you're only a D8 class, so you, you don't have a ton of hit points here. Um, that's nice to get more, and it will help your saving throws. Um, your, uh, you know, maintaining concentration is, is big for us <clears throat> to keep our armor class up. So, uh, at level 12, you are a, an Artificer 9, um, and you get a really cool feature as an armor, um, armor modifications. So most, most Artificers still only have um, three infusions at this level. Um, thanks to us being an armorer, we can actually have as many as five now. Two of them have to go on your armor, and basically what it says is your armor is sort of split up into pieces. So you have a chest piece, a helm, two gauntlets, boots, and you can put an infusion theoretically on each one of those. Instead of before, it would just say you can only have one infusion for your armor. Now it's saying essentially you can have five infusions on your armor. At least two of them have to be on your armor. So, you know, we're going to say keep enhanced defense on your armor, um, probably radiant weapon since it's a gauntlet and it's part of your armor. You can still keep that as part of your armor. With the other three, obviously, keep Repulsion Shield like we already had. Um, and then I would pick up Resistant Armor, which is going to give you resistance to one sort of elemental damage type of your choice. Fire, cold, you know, acid, lightning, etc. You could put that, say, on your helmet. Um, and now you'd have resistance to that damage type, which is great. Obviously, it's going to be really great sometimes and worthless other times, but still a nice to have. As far as the fifth one goes, the, you know, part of me wants to say take the homunculus, which is essentially a mechanical pet that you would create for yourself. And it can attack, but it's a, it's a very weak attack, but still, it's a little extra damage. That's nice. It can do other things. But you already have a familiar, and, and so all of the other things that it can do, your familiar can essentially do too. Your familiar might not be as tanky, but... I would probably say, if it were me, I think I would just put Enhanced Weapon on my other gauntlet for those times that I am using both of my fists to make an attack and I don't need the extra armor class for my shield. Um, you know, again, landing those attacks is super important, not just for the damage, but for the imposing disadvantage on your enemy. So that's, that's probably what I would do. Um, you do get third level... Uh, spells here as well now. Um, it, it would be worth considering taking haste and replacing Shield of Faith with haste for your concentration when you have a third level spell slot. Um, it, it gives you the same benefit of the plus two to your armor class, 
but you get the other benefits of haste, right? You have extra movement speed, um, and you get to make one extra attack per turn, which is great. Again, giving you both extra damage and an extra chance or maybe even target to impose disadvantage on. Um, those things are super important here in your role as a tank. Um, plus you have advantage on dexterity saves, which is a potential weakness for this class, right? Somebody shoots a fireball at you, you're probably failing your saving throw. <laughs> Um, so that'll be nice at least to have advantage on those. Um, of course, the big potential drawback with haste is that when the spell ends, and that might be when you get hit and therefore lose concentration, <clears throat> for a whole turn you can't take actions and you can't move. And that is potentially a little bit devastating. Um, so that's a risk that you run, but it might be worth taking haste there. The reality, of course, is that if you have access to haste, you should arguably be casting it on your hardest hitting companion, right? If you've got a great weapon master, polearm master, barbarian out there and, and he's doing 20 to 30 damage on a single hit, he might be a little miffed if you put haste on yourself. <clears throat> Sorry. But anyway, something to consider. Uh, I would also pick up Revivify. It's great to have a resurrect option in, in the party, even if you already have a support character, because if your support character goes down and nobody has a healing potion, it's nice to be able to bring them back. Uh, well, sorry, if they're dead, a healing potion won't matter anyway, so if your support character dies, it's nice to be able to bring them back. All right, at level 13, you are an Artificer 10, and you get one more infusion, you can infuse one more uh, item now, and I'm going to recommend that you make yourself a cloak of protection. So we haven't talked about this yet, but um, starting at level six, artificers can replicate magic items as one of their infusions, um, and that's awesome and super cool and fun and powerful. Now, um, in my opinion, the early access magic items that you can replicate are not particularly strong. Um, there's some things that are really cool and everybody wants a bag of holding, right? Um, but then there are other things that are maybe a little more utility, and I said level six, sorry, you can start doing that as early as level two, as soon as you get infusions. Um, but they're mostly cool kind of utility type things, alchemy jugs, bag of holding, which is great, Goggles of Night, Rope of Climbing, lots of cool things. And then at six, Cloak of Elvenkind, Boots of Elvenkind, Gloves of Thievery. These things are all nice, but they don't do a lot for our numbers outside of specific situations. Um, and particularly not for, you know, our tankiness numbers. So that's why I've held off until level 10 to maybe pick one up. But one of the items that you can craft at level 10 is a Cloak of Protection, which gives you a plus one to your armor class and we love plus one to our armor class. Um, you also, oh, also re realize that um, your enhanced defense infusion that you have had on your armor since you had infusions uh, now gives you a plus two bump to your armor class instead of a plus one. Uh, an enhanced weapon gives you a plus two to your attacks and not a plus one. So make sure you have enhanced weapon on your sort of main hand, right? And, and maybe radiant, uh, weapon on your shield hand. Hopefully you can at least still cast light and or blind even if it's holding a shield. Talk that over with your DM. Um, but anyway, so lots of lots of great bumps here for us at level 10. Um, damage report for a level 13 character. Um, you are now with the shield spell active sitting at a 31 armor class. <laughs> And that's ridiculous. Um, you have 131 hit points. Keep in mind, right? Um, unless the enemy has a plus 12 to hit or better, they are only hitting you if they crit. Um, now, again, this is only assuming that you have spell, sh spell slots and reaction for that matter to cast the shield spell. Um, but even if you don't have spell slots left, your War Mage feature gives you a plus two as a reaction, right? And so keep that in mind as you are, as you're playing, right? If you get hit, 
by an attack, but it's only maybe one higher than your armor class, don't don't burn a shield spell. Use your war magic feat that will make that attack miss and thereby save your save your shield slot, your spell slots, right? And again, that's just one more reason why more likely than not, you're going to have access to first level spell slots for that shield spell when you need it. Um, so um, that would still be a 28 armor class, right, with that War Mage feature. So metagaming is bad, but if it seems like the enemy is, is only a plus 5 to hit or less, toss that shield away, right, and start swinging with your fists. Um, because additional armor isn't doing you any good beyond a certain point, right? So try and, again, play that by ear, keep in mind, but... It's really awesome to be able to get a 31 AC when you need it because an adult white dragon, which is our boss fight for this uh, for this particular level, um, is only a plus 11 to hit. So um, they would only be doing four damage per round to you. Your DTPR is four, and um, it would take you 33 rounds to die. A sort of common regular encounter uh, was going to be against five helmed horrors, and your DTPR is eight, and it would take you 17 rounds to die at that rate. And then against 10 kobolds, it's still four damage. They're, they've only been hitting you if they crit for a long time now, um, and it would take you 33 rounds to die. All right, at level 14, you're an Artificer 11. I forgot to mention, last level, you did get a feature as well called um, Magic Item Adept. Uh, what was it called? <laughs> magic Item Adept. Um, that lets you be attuned to up to four magic items, which is fantastic, especially since you just made one for yourself and you probably needed that attunement slot by this level. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, okay, so at Artificer 11, you get to create a spell storing item. And this is so cool and fun and unique. Um, it basically, it lets you create this item that you can store artificer spells in. They can only be first or second level. <clears throat> they have to require an action to cast. They have to be an artificer spell, and you can store a number of charges essentially in there equivalent to twice your intelligence modifier. So eight. Eight charges in there and you can renew them w once per day that's really strong um, only first or second level spells but there's some great options here I'd love to hear what you guys would would stick in there um, I mean the the ones that come to mind for me I think blur would be really great to give to um, you know someone who's maybe not standing next to you because they can activate that on themselves it requires concentration so it wouldn't work for a spellcaster but say you've got a ranged weapon user or something now enemies have disadvantage when they're making attacks against them um, that's really cool just sticking cure wounds in there would be some great especially in between combat healing just click 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 heal somebody probably all the way to full with eight casts of cure wounds right um, enlarge, enlarge, reduce would be a great spell. Maybe give it to your, well, it couldn't be your barbarian because they can't concentrate while they're raging and it's a concentration spell, but maybe, you know, your, your Pamlock or your fighter or something like that. Um, it, it would let them grow and then their weapon attacks would do an extra 1d4 per hit. Um, that's some nice extra damage. Or they could even use it offensively, right, to shrink, uh, to shrink an enemy if they fail their save. And so that the enemy shrinks and their weapon attacks do 1d4 less of damage every hit. That's cool. So I don't know. Lots of fun. Let me know in the comments what, uh, what your guys' favorite spell to stick in the spell storing item might be. At level 15, you're an Artificer 12. And you get what will be, for our video anyway, our final ability score increase or feat. This is a tough call for me. Um... On the one hand, I'd love to bump my intelligence and get it to a 20, thereby you know making your spells that much harder to resist and letting you hit with your gauntlets more frequently and do more damage. Um, I'd probably take a feat to make us a little tankier and or better at support. I'm thinking maybe the fighting initiate feat that's new as per Tasha's that lets you take a fighting style, right? And that's super cool. There's lots of good ones. Um, the... 
the defensive fighting style would give you a plus one to your AC, which of course I'm gonna love. Um, intercept might be as good or better because it would let you, you know, even if the enemy that you're pummeling decides to attack somebody else and then they hit them, even with disadvantage, then you could intercept some of that damage, which is really cool. <clears throat> the problem is it takes your reaction. And we have so many uses for our reaction already that I, I think I'd maybe not do that, but worth considering. Um, you know, the, the best one might be Heavy Armor Master. Um, it, it, for those who don't know, Heavy Armor Master, basically, if you're wearing heavy armor, it will reduce, well, it lets you bump your strength by one, which doesn't do a lot for us, but whatever. And then it reduces... Um, basically non-magical weapon attacks, so piercing damage, uh, bludgeoning damage, or slashing damage, non-magical, by three. Just three damage, but still, that really adds up over time. Um, you know, getting hit, if you're getting hit frequently, especially, knocking three off every one of those um, can really add up, and I'll talk about it at the end. When you look at the numbers, I think it makes a big difference. That said, for for the num for the for the purpose of our build and for the numbers, I just I want to see how high we can get the armor class. So I'm taking the fighting initiate defensive fighting style for the plus one armor class. Um, but you do you. At level 16, we're an artificer 13. We get level four artificer spells. Um, there's some good ones. Stone skin is maybe my favorite. It requires your concentration, so you'd lose your armor your plus two to armor class that you had, but then you have resistance to all non-magical weapon damage, um, which is fantastic. The problem with it is it's a hundred gold every time you cast it. It consumes, I think it's diamond dust um, when you cast a spell worth a hundred gold every single time you cast it. So difficult to sustain, cool to have when you need it. Um, there's, some, there's some other great options, some good control options like resilient sphere, some good support options like freedom of movement. Um, but, you know, take something that uh, that looks fun and useful there. Um, at level 17, final level for us, we are an Artificer 14, and we get one more infusion, uh, and we're going to create yet another magic item for ourselves, and now we can do a Ring of Protection, which is going to give us another plus one to our armor class and we are a magic item savant so we can attune up to five magic items and again you probably need that so that's super cool um and our armor class is through the roof specifically um we are sitting at um a 33 armor class if you have access to spell uh shield the shield spell i should say if you have your your spell slots um, and that's ridiculous. So the boss fight at this level was an adult red dragon um, And they are only at a plus 14 to hit so they're only gonna hit you if they roll a 19 or a 20 and they're gonna do uh, Seven damage per round to you. You'll take seven damage per round uh, on average and um, it will take you 24 rounds to die against an adult red dragon if they do nothing but wail on you the whole time. Um, against five earth elementals, uh, 12 damage taken per round, and 15 rounds to die. And against 10 kobolds, four DTPR, and 43 rounds before they kill you. So, um, one note before we finish with the level by level. At the next level, Level 18, Artificer 15, you get your ultimate um, armorer feature, and it's called Perfected Armor, and it's so good. It's so good that it almost is making me feel like I don't want to multi-class at all and just make a beeline for level 15. Um, if your enemy is huge or smaller, um, within 30 feet of you, you, as a reaction, can essentially throw out a grappling hook from your armor and pull them to you, um, and then make a weapon attack as a reaction. Um, and man, talk about protecting your back line, right? Because if that weapon attack hits, now they have disadvantage against anybody but you. So they've gotten to your, to your cleric or your sorcerer in the back, and you just grab them, pull them back towards you, make a 
make an attack at them, and now they have disadvantage against anybody other than you. I mean, it's it's such a great tank feature. The problems with it are a they get to make a a, a DC they get to make a save, and it's a strength save. And if it's a melee character at level 15 plus, they probably have a pretty good bonus to their strength saving throw. Now, that's not to say that they're always going to make it, but it's going to feel really crappy when you do this really cool thing and then it doesn't hit. By contrast, Thorn Whip, which you had at level 1, will pull them only 10 feet, but they don't get to save against it. You just, if you land the attack, you pull them 10 feet. Right, so in a way, it's almost stronger. Um, you get to use that feature a number of times per day as per your proficiency bonus. Again, really cool, really tempting to try and beeline for it, but it comes so late. You know, level 15, a lot of campaigns don't even go to level 15, so I figure we're probably better off doing the multi class dipping um, along the way to really kind of get those cool extra spells and features and bumps to our armor class, but. It's tempting. It's tempting to just beeline for 15. All right, final thoughts. You know, it's it's important to understand what makes a good tank in Dungeons & Dragons, right? It's not just about being hard to kill. It's about making yourself an attractive target to the enemy and also, um, you know, being able to protect and support uh, your allies and you know do damage and make yourself a threat on the battlefield, right? Um, I want to you know when when we compare the other tank builds that we've done to this one, I think it, it it's it's interesting to see how it stacks up, right? The the barbarian um, generally did a lot more damage than than these other t than the other two, um, but they were a lot squishier. They were they were using reckless attack every single turn, primarily to um, to make themselves an attractive target, right? So that the enemy would be more likely to attack them because they would have advantage when it, when doing so. Um, but they had a relatively low armor class, so even though they had resistance to almost all damage and a ton of hit points, um, they did not live as long because they were just getting hit almost every turn, right? Um, almost every time the enemy took a swing at them, they were getting a hit. They had some great battlefield control. They were locking down at reach, right, with their with their polearm master and sentinel feats. Um, but just a little less tanky. Well, okay, a lot less tanky. And you can see the numbers. Check the graphs. They're in the video description in the show notes. Um, by comparison, the the paladin tank, the tankadin. He didn't do as much damage outside of maybe Smite, right? Um, and I shouldn't say he, they, because it could very well be a, a female Tankadin. Um, but they had a very high armor class and, and really good hit points as well. So they, were, they, they took forever to kill um, when compared to the Barbarian. They were not as much a threat. On the battlefield, they did bring a lot of great healing options and some nice support options um, as well, and, and auras and things like that that paladins bring, which I think you know made them a great sort of tanky support character. But they were definitely kind of less the the enemy might be less prone to attack them rather than you know one of their companions, and so in a way the tankiness might be wasted on them, or at least might not be as useful. Right. Um, we tried to make up for that with the Oath of the Crown. Um, you know, their channel divinity is kind of a soft taunt. They would get a compelled dual spell that they could use as sort of a soft taunt. Um, but generally speaking, less of a threat on the battlefield. I feel like the Artificer, by comparison, the Armorer Artificer, by comparison, really kind of gives you the best of both worlds. They do okay damage. Um, they are incredibly tanky with their really high AC. They have some support uh, and and sort of healing type um, features, but you know that that give the enemy disadvantage when they attack someone other than you. Every single time you hit an enemy is so so good. Um, 
it doesn't force the enemy to attack you, no, but it's about as close as you get in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, you know, I, I, you do notice when you look at the numbers that this character is, is, is harder to kill than anything I've come up with thus far for the boss fights. Um, so against those dragons, they were living longer than the paladin even, uh, especially once you got up into the higher levels. Um, against the regular average fights, it was not as good because ultimately when an enemy is only critting you, or sorry, only hitting you if they crit, then you know you get to a point where having a higher AC doesn't do you any more good and it just comes down to you know having more hit points if you want to survive longer. And the Paladin did have the heavy armor master feat which really helped against those uh, you know lots of little attacks um, to reduce every one of them by three if they would land. So anyway, um, yeah. That's the that's the armor. I think it would be a lot of fun to play in game. I'm I think I'm willing to overlook my aversion to steampunk uh, to give this one a try, and I hope that that you guys enjoy it and have fun with it in game. Um, that's the show for today. Please remember we do have a subreddit, so make sure to check it out. I'm putting it along the bottom here, the bo the bottom here. Um, go to our subreddit, get involved in the community, um, comment and critique one another's suggestions and ideas, but no trolling. Um, no, no, no toxicity, please, on our subreddit. Thank you. Um, you can also find me on Facebook and on Twitter. And um, quick note, I'm probably not going to be doing a show next week. Sorry. It's Christmas this week, and I'd like to sort of just take some time off from both my job job and my second job that I've created for myself that I love, but um, it kind of does require a lot of work. So I'm going to take a week off. Um, I might be able to slip in a sliding into my DMs or a shorts episode or something like that, but I'm not going to have like a full build episode um, next week. So anyway, um, Merry Christmas, whether you celebrate it or not. I hope you have happy holidays. And, uh, yeah, make sure that you guys reach out to me and let me know if you have a build that you want me to do an episode on and take a look at. Give me as much detail and information as you can about the goals and the specifics and things, and I will do my best to optimize it for you. Thanks. Love you guys. You're awesome. Have a fantastic day, and we'll see you soon.